Well, David, I'm uh, so glad to have you here to share memories about working on the Brave Little Toaster together. It's, it, it, to me, it's still, it's such a landmark in not just my career, but my life and just with you and Chris and, and everybody that was on our cast and crew is just, uh, it was such a, a family that came together for this and we wound up caring about each other as much as we cared for the characters and the characters cared for each other and it just seemed to be a just something that that to us had lasting sort of emotional value and recently i've just seen a surge of people getting in touch with me and with other people that worked on the film to talk about different ways that it was meaningful to them so it's been just a joy to see those things emerge but uh, I just I, if you have any memories about the first contacts from I think it was Willard Carroll that got us together with the, I think he Willard, yeah, Willard and Tom brought you to Tom's attention and then yeah. Tom and Willard brought you to my attention. Yeah, I, I it was it was way early on for me. Um, it was it was the first real thing that I that I did. And it was. Um, I, I had never done anything basically I hadn't done all that much at all and I'd really never done any animation so uh, I was working we were working a lot to pencil drawing or what would what, what, yeah the the and it then, was a combination of storyboards and uh, pencil yeah, tests we had, we had talked a lot though about um, the toaster the reflective nature of the toaster that the toaster reflected it, it in retrospect, as an older person now, yeah, the the there was there sort of was a philosophical bent to it to every character what they were, yeah, you know that the toaster was reflect. It, I I don't know why that would be, but the 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 side of the toaster reflects is reflective, right? And the yeah. lamp shines a light. And the the vacuum cleaner is a conservative old and it hold and it holds things inside. That's its function. Yeah, and and so we did talk about that, and there were a lot of themes in it. Right. Some were used more than others, and then there were all these songs in it. And I ended up using, I think, the songs almost more than anything to define how to unify sort of the whole thing. And I think that's, be, I mean, in, when I look at it in retrospect, I didn't even think of it when I was doing it, is that I had a lot of musical theater background. Yeah. So I sort of, I thought, well, you have these songs in it and we should use all that material to animate and, and, and put together with whatever other stuff that we needed to delineate the, 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 the trajectory, the film, and, and and the sense of unity that we're trying to do the film. But I, I was really flying by the seat of my <laughs> pants, really, from the beginning. But I do remember Chris and I would we would look at the pencil, the animatics, basically yes. what it was, what we were scoring to originally, right? Yes. And then this color would come in. Yeah. And you'd see all this beautiful, which what, what I love about animation, you'd see all this beautiful detail that is unique, I think, to animation. It just it's just minutia detail that in the hands of somebody good at it helps and helps and helps tell the story. And so the 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 eyes getting wider, the you know, the blanket or the 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 toaster, like that little poster behind you. Yeah, yeah. I remember when the toaster's running away during that weird sequence with all the frogs and everything. And he, yes, and she, I guess it's she. Yeah, I, and that was one of the, yeah, I, I refer to her as she now, yes. Yeah. And she she runs away to that flower. Remember that? Yes, no. yes. And I, I was reviewing that today. I was going through all the, your cues, which are basically wall to wall. And I was struck by that because you started with the craziness of, frogs and squirrels making faces in the toaster, which was freaking it out. And it flees and then finds refuge in that little quiet spot with the flower. But remember, there was some guy, there was some sound design in that. It was, uh, we started with that tenor that, you know, da 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 Yes. And then there was, and then we started a little wall. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Before that, 
there was a guy that was doing we were doing like sound design right what was yes it? yes it was the it was called ear town movies right. and one of them happened to be ollie johnson's son who was one of walt's nine old men and yes so certain things just like the the meadow sounds themselves the you know the frog ribbits and different things okay. birds and things it like was all that sort of musical sounds, need musical right? rhythms yeah it, and then you segued it, into that uh, right uh, but remember this was what you wanted to do yeah it, it wasn't i mean it wasn't a foregone conclusion mm -hmm. that whole sequence to me is just magical and then that that starts like that and then it's Busby Burke, you know, there's the yeah. Busby Berkeley thing. And, and, and the you know, tenor fish. <laughs> and the tenor fish. And, and I mean, almost throughout the film, there it's so sophisticated. But as the color came in for me, as I, as I watched it, I, let me just turn this on. This is like, sorry. Um, it's okay. We will edit um, this. That's okay. I, 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 <laughs> as, as all that color came in, yeah, this is the first time I'd seen animatic to color to how nuanced everything was and how good I've done a fair amount of animation after I did toaster. Right. And how good it is for music, what you can do with music with it, because it's it's not realistic in a way, except that it's very this was a very philosophical um, movie there was a there was a lot of thought that went into every character and their journey it's a picaresque it's like a picaresque novel it's it it's a you know they're on the road you know they have their you know fights and everything yep. and then it's doom and disaster at the end mm -hmm. i remember that the that junkyard song that that van dyke wrote worthless yeah and, right and then there was a seven minute cue and then a three, there was 10 minutes of music after yes. that straight, right? Yes. And so I remember trying to figure out how to come out of that song to their kind of doom. Yeah. To then him finding them, trying to save them, and then him, the child. What? what, what, what yeah, what his was name was Rob. And right. And and how he now was in danger of of, you know, that whole nearly dying the, yeah right and then the cathartic thing when the toaster sacrifices herself yep and that whole thing and that was the last cue i wrote i remember and i remember staying up all night sketching it and then all that whole flight to japan working on it and then for hours when we got to japan working on it to finish because i'd never done anything that elaborate and that long to do, I had done the end title already, but that seven minute sequence, um, I had not done. And so I remember that, you know, as well. And and I, th I think I got that color like really late as well. Yeah. And there was a lot of sinking and stuff in it. And, you know, it was very scary. There, there was a lot of detail that you addressed in the score. There were so many changes of fortune where they're almost gotten and then there's the relief of them getting away, but then it turns bad again. And then there's the joy in the middle of all that of, oh, oh my God, that that's the person we've been searching for this whole time is actually here. Maybe there's a reunion. So there's the awakening of a, of a bigger hope than they've had in a, most of their journey. But then it's quickly dashed by the new dangers, which are going to imperil even him now. Yes. And uh, you were just going with the ebb and flow of that constantly That's the thing jerry is that it ebbs it that it affects him it affects the human being yes you know it, it, that was the, i think the real strength of that whole sequence is that he he just doesn't quite remember his girl his girlfriend saying oh, you know and there was that whole song before that he wrote yes. that like little rap song like weird what year is this? 86, 85, 86. Yeah, so, it was so right was, around in there. We were, so we're sort of yeah, referencing a, 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 the, a rap song, but you know, it the, was the cutting edge, uh, right. whatever technology was cutting edge then, which seems very old now, but yes. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and her just telling him to blow it off and him just not, he's not down with either way. And then he, he, ends up at this junkyard and sees them it, it just and and that and that the the absolute like 
darkness of it. They're, they're just, it just got darker and darker with that machine. Yeah. And I, we, we did that to, you know, as the machine comes down and that sound effect and, and all that. Yeah, the, the electromagnet and the big it, jaws of death it, that it, crush everything. It was a frigging miracle we got that done at all. And, and people, t I looked at that and, and uh, fresh and, you know, people have so mentioned so often, especially in the last 10 years, uh, of how dark that song was and that whole se following sequence was, but Worthless has each character singing about its lot in life and then dying. It has the, its demise where it is crunched into a little cube and that's it, it's gone. Yeah. And there's even one of them, the bus from the, the Indian reservation actually tosses itself into the masher it knows yeah, I remember when we, we pre-recorded all of that, which was the least stressful part but then you were, of the process is that yeah. and I remember you talking to everybody and they were all there. Dina was there, you know, everybody was there that because yep. they were all part of, I don't know if John was there, but you know, D D Dina, Dina was there. I think Tim, I, I don't, whatever. Well, yeah. It's like, I was, yeah, anytime there was singing, I had to sing for, for John, but. Uh, you sang for John. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and which you talked me into, by the way, I, I, I was not volunteering for that, but you were like, you, you, well, you're sitting in for John to feed lines to them. Just you're used to doing his voice, sing it. Because <laughs> he I, wasn't, the, he wasn't. He was, the, yeah, he had been, well, uh, quick sidebar is I had written the role for him. He got his big break to go out to Saturday Night Live. His agent was just going to blow us off and take him away and he wasn't going to be in the movie. So I pled with John to please stay and do the voice so he did he couldn't stay but he just said well i'll come in and record with you by this day and then i have to leave town i wasn't in the same way that you weren't done writing the score as we flew to japan to meet the orchestra you were still writing on the plane which i clearly remember i was had stayed up all night and wrote the end of the movie because i wasn't done with the script and i needed to record the whole features worth of John Lovitz's lines. Right. And I couldn't just do his lines because it's part of an ensemble. So I had to write everyone's lines in order to write his lines. Oh, no so I did the right through the night, go to re the recording studio, do a marathon session where the entire movie's worth of his lines we recorded in one endless session, which almost died because he ran out of energy in the middle, of course, because we're working him to death. Yeah. And then he I took him for a walk outside and he sucked it up and got the energy back to focus and finish the whole rest of the movie. Yeah. And so, but then he was gone. So for singing, John wasn't available. And so yeah. you, your suggestion was, well, then for the ensemble, I sat in as John and fed John's lines to everyone else to do the ensemble recording with the rest of the, of yeah. the team. So you were used to hearing me mimic him just as Timp and talk me into doing the, the final, but anyway, it's a little sidebar, but that's why that happened. And then we wound up being re recording together and uh, um, for Worthless and then the whole junkyard. Uh, well, no, we did. We did all the songs at a, a studio in Topanga that's not there anymore that I don't remember where that was. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a place we had worked at. Chris and I had worked at and um, and we got a really good band. I mean, it was, a, you know, we had a really good union band and then and then we did all the you know the scoring in japan which i guess tom figured out and right in this gorgeous hall in some university like an hour outside of tokyo and we were there every day for five days and it was the, it, we, we were using a digital 24 track recorder like really early and sean right. murphy who sean does murphy, yeah. on will williams uh, uh still working who i just did west side story with you know wow. um, uh recorded it and it's, we like had all these like great people working on it and the orchestra was great you know it was uh, it it just it, it was all terrifying because like you know, th there was so much to do and I was not, I mean, I'd done a lot of conducting, but I wasn't experienced doing this, but we, and I remember the first cue was the, the Phil Hartman air conditioner cue. Remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. That, oh, that was the first cue we recorded. Starts subtle and then gets huge right. and then gets really soft again afterwards. Right. Uh, I don't know why we started with that, but we did start with that. And I know we didn't do the last cue 
till the end because we had to get it copied in Japan. Right. Get it copied in America because it wasn't done. So Tom figured, they figured, everybody sort of figured out how to get it done. And then we hadn't sweetened the songs because you allowed, I, I just would never have been able to do it. We argued about this, I remember, because mm -hmm. you wanted to do the song sweetening with the orchestra before we left and I just couldn't do it. So we did right. that when we got, when we got back. Yeah. So, well, I, and it's the weirdest part of it. I think I, the, the song sweetening was, was, I, I don't know. Anyway, what? Well, it all worked out, but I, I you know, the thing that I, I, I was a, I was amazed with how you chose to, bring music in and the trips you took the different cues on it was almost wall-to-wall -wall music and there were things like like <clears throat> and, well, for example just the opening cue with the the fog and the yeah. you know first the black screen and then it's birds flying away in the fog and it, just noticing the cottage and going in to look at the at the every, the quiet house and looking at the shafts of morning sunlight coming through just you captured such a magic and hints at all the different emotional journeys we were going to take in that i was so amazed and and for me hearing that for the first time with an orchestra because as you no, worked you gotta hear, hear anything right because we, we could we couldn't preview anything and right, right. i absolutely trusted you to be the guy yeah. and so when i sat there in that orchestra hall and heard all those cues including yeah. that opening for the first time that was to me that was opening the Christmas present. Like for the first time, my ears were hearing what you made. I think Chris sat with you. The, yes. the animating thing of that opening cue was the toaster theme, which is the, the main thing. Cause the, it's, it's, it's thirds. It's, it, it's, it's pitches to, it's, it's, it's a white key, a white key. It's, it's like the, the first white key and the third white key. It's mm -hmm. And, and they, they, they reflect each other. And so basically the score was based on that little, these thirds mm -hmm. of the toaster and City of Light. Right. The song City of Light, I used pretty much pervasively through the whole film because I felt like if it is, if there are, you know, there are a lot of songs, but those, but that song was the most melodic it's the first song it's sort of there yes. and it's not really an anthem but it's there together you know it, they're, it they're is their sense of purpose to, yeah, yes their sense of purpose they're going to the city of light they don't know they're of course they're not they're going to get screwed they're not going there mm -hmm. they're going to hell they're going yes to Dante's inferno before they get out of it right but um th those two and, and i did it I mean, I had a theme for like every character because that we did together. That I remember I played a yep. theme for every character and, and we did talk about that. And right. I did use it. There was a, there was a blanket theme. There was a, 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 yeah, a they, they, lampy they, theme. There was, you know, a, 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 a Kirby theme. Yep. But they were sort of here and there sparkled throughout, but it was mainly the, the reflection. It, 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 it's the toaster reflecting, the audience reflecting emotions, you know, all that and it, kind of shapes yes, and it, and it, in a way thing, in a way, not to be hyperbolic, but. But, you know, you know, people have talked to me about that and the, the toaster and toaster's gender, et cetera. And I, I was telling them that, that it was, that was sort of a motivating thing was the toaster being a warm, center so it was like a warmth to sort of attract the other characters but also a male would see a male reflected in the toaster and feel comfort there a female would see female reflected a flower sees a flower reflected flower and reflected. thinks it's another flower right. and falls in love with it so right. toaster is sort of everyone's reflective source of the like looking into themselves and so that was something that was on my mind as we were working on it and that flower scene was a a a transitional scene, I was going to say bookend, but it's actually a middle scene to a three part scene yeah, having where, to do with Blanky yeah. or Blanky in the in the thicket the night before the flower right. is met. It's the little yellow soft thing that wants to be 
to cuddle with someone because it's the insecurity blanket without the kid with the kid it's a security blanket without the kid it's an insecurity blanket and so it's looking to cuddle and it's like the radio won't cuddle and the vacuum won't cuddle and the lamp tells it to go find its own place to sleep right. it'll buzz ball and it goes to toaster and you feel like well toaster's the warmest one toaster will at least accommodate and instead toaster's tired and sort of gently but says no i'm tired yeah. and pushes it away so and your your cue there your score started at the moment that the first refusal to to blanky like when blanky is turned away you started the the music and it just so it becomes blanky's song that in the thicket that night and you wind up seeing it go alone and try to cuddle with itself on the dirt and then you move up to the moon and you just did this beautiful sweet sad moment there and i the fact that you started it with it's like the little dagger to its heart it's soft yellow <laughs> heart is the reason you started the music and then it's that whole scene was about that it wasn't like a night scene cue it was a blanket feels alone cue well, I, I was you know? i was i was on board all the way i mean I, yeah i i mean i do i do love I do love animation when it's good, like like this, and this is just spectacular. Where it's so clear what it is, but there's so much nuance in it. There, it, it, it's so fast in a way, and yet there's so much that you can do with it. And and that scene, like with the remember, she goes to the flower. Then the flower, the flower is sees itself, yeah. and 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 it's and then it's all crazy and everything. And then they all get together, and then there's this beautiful, like, what we call it, a big high shot, like a, a, a of them walking in the dark woods. Remember? Oh yeah, yeah. The the what is that the movie? looming red redwood right. forest. Uh, right. The, yeah. But the POV is like way up. Yeah. Right? It, it's, it, and I know you've yes. probably fought for every freaking <laughs> shot like that because I'm sure that was. You know, it's that not tricky to do shots. Like it, that? It, it was tricky to do, but they sort of the, you know, I, I didn't have, it was just wrestling. I, thankfully, I wasn't wrestling politically or with any studio or committee that would give notes. Tom was just wonderfully accommodating. It's like, you know, you're directing this, pick your shots, right. whatever. But we were wrestling with just time and resources yeah, and, and what we could accomplish. And we right. would just, we were so like, oh, that's not how we would do it if I had the money. But It'll suffice. It's like just it just, the, it just seems so cinematic, all of it, you know. That's well, it, it it had come out of this period where I was dying to do something cinematic, and we for a brief period of time, Brad Bird and I were backed by Gary Kurtz, who had just done Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, and he knew that we wanted to make a feature of the Spirit, Will Eisner's comic book, as a, as a noir a film noir, a big audience feature, and so he got it. He went. He's working with, you know, Spielberg, Lucas and Coppola, and he saw our animated film as fitting in that canon of work as a producer. So we felt like he was a gift and it was, was going to vault animation forward in a big way. And then he was going through bankruptcy <clears throat> and couldn't do it. Yeah. And when that died, I, you know, and I, I just told him if it ever gets happens, I'm back. But yeah. for now, I've stepped away. And as soon as I was free, Tom called. So he tom wilhite and offered me the ability to develop write, and direct the brave little toaster and he he and he saw that vacuum where he realized like i was trying to get out there and make a movie that was big wow. cinema and had gary kurtz producing and to compete in that market place for storytelling and so with toaster it was like well here's hardly any money and hardly any time but you know all that creative stuff you want to get out you can do that i won't get in your way so also it precursors you know what it precursors so right and what it's saying so but your your score then for for the flower where it's like the crazy getting away from the squirrels and then there's that sweet moment with the flower and it and toaster realizes it out of that scene it's like it had pushed the little yellow blanket away the night before now it has a same exact color by the way i made sure we use the same yellow for the flower as blanky and it's another little soft vulnerable thing reaching for it and now it could have helped blanky the night before but now it can't because it's impossible i'm not a flower i can't stay so it has to walk away from that and the flower wilts and 
in your music, there was that real, that sadness of, and, and realization. So the next time it sees Blanky and Blanky's being sort of hassled by the other characters, it's the first time it really steps up and protects Blanky. Yeah. And then Blanky thanks him by making a tent out of itself to, for them the next night. And yeah. you just kept that thread of emotion. I, I remember, I remember ta- now that you're saying this, we must have talked a lot because I remember all this, you're saying this. What you're saying, I remember you saying to me. So we must have talked a lot. I don't know how much I played for you. But, um, I, I don't. The, I only recall you doing a few themes at the piano, but not any sort of orchestral temps. And um, come over so, here. Do you think? Or did, did I, I, I? I remember going to your house a few times and having you sit at your piano and and, right. and play some up, ideas. I upstairs. I remember. Right. Uh, but then, but then, it was such a crazy race. You know, I. I we were both doing a hell of a lot of things overlappings but we had that, had those moments to huddle over characters and emotions and intentions but as far as really hearing your music yeah. uh you that really, was happening in the in the hall you were really clear about a lot of it it was it was really i remember it was very clear what you wanted to do so it was really helpful being a younger you know less experienced composer having a little bit more idea of the story and, and not just the story but just the kind of vibe of what you know each character was in in a in a kind of not just a plot way but in a sort of their character way yes and i I've, i didn't realize it necessarily at the time but and and like i said we did all these themes so we had them and we you would approve them so it was all available, but it, 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 it really helped me. Like I had all this material to go to, to figure out sort of what to do with everything. And as I got the color and looked at it, the whole thing, it became clear sort of what the trajectory was of, of the whole thing. And of course it has the greatest last line, right? You're all just a pile of junk. <laughs> You're all a bunch of junk. You're all a bunch of junk. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like, it's <clears throat> freaking brilliant. They are a bunch of junk. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all a bunch of junk, right? Yes, but but having somebody who, who will bother to pick you up when you're dented and hammer the dents out and dust you off a little right. bit, like that's what we need. Right. And and you I, scored that. By the way, I loved how you continued the stopped, craziness of the for the line that for that. Yeah, and but you but it was so great how you uh, followed that huge whatever ten minutes of music near the end where it goes through all the way to hope and hope dashed and then all the way to hell and then relief and then the repair and then the sweetness of of like doing a lot yes that was that was the most i had never done anything remotely like that all and then the sweetness of yeah all i did was i i i that's the one i wrote on the plane what we were talking about but i just followed the story and i had done most of the music before so i kind of knew where we were going the the do, you know the the absolute doom and the what what did you name the 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 metal thing that there was the elect, electromagnet right was the, the, but the, the and then there was the it, compactor the right. trash the compactor and the electromagnet but the, but the electromagnet would have eyes and then the eyes yeah. would disappear right and yes like, yes yeah. There, there was all these like weird, almost horror movie yes. things in it. And the, and the compact was part of, of Worthless because that's yeah. how Worthless started, was the rhythm of the compactor. It was the right. percussion, right. Uh, yeah. Right, and, and, and so that was set up. And then, you know, this stuff happens and, and the, the song sort of ends and it doesn't really end the song, remember? Yeah. It sort of fades out and we faded in the queue. We cross faded in yes. the queue. And kept right. going, and yes. Then, and then this, what do you call it? The magnetic, the, the... The compactor. Right, okay. So sort of has eyes, sort of doesn't... Well, the, the electromagnet has the eyes. And yeah, the, the compactor also has a face. It's like the chomper is like teeth. But I, re- but I remember the, the, the and eyes, magnet yeah. thing didn't like yes. have eyes and then it would like... Yes, it would well, hide it them. Not, it would hide them around right. a human, yes. Right. And, and, and just, you know dark, 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 you know, screaming, screaming. Yeah. And then I remember there's a build as the toaster climbs up, 
right? That's all based on on City of Light. Um, is it based on? City and of it Light? gets further and further and further. I purposely right. in boarding that section made as it climbed to see to get a view of where the master was and what it could do. It was actually climbing in order to get that view further and further away where it was impossible for it to help. So that last leap seemed like an impossible right. thing to do. Right. And I remember making the music build. Yep. And then instead of climaxing, it sort of, it went to this sort of thick cord as it fell. Yep. And then as it crunched, right? And mm -hmm. it stopped the compactor. It, again, it wasn't cathartic. It just like released, there was no climax. It was, it was like, an, like an exhale, it, it, yeah. It's like an exhale. It wasn't, yeah. there was no climax and then we're saved, right? It was, they just, by the, you know, skinny, skin, skin, <laughs> save, save themselves, you know? Yeah. And really the climax became in the music, at least at the end of the scene, when after he says, you know, they're all just a bunch of junk as they win and then and then the, and then we go up to the bigger and higher never, and higher I've shot never, i've never written anything else um quite like that where 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 you know up 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 jump and then the 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 music at the jump is just kind of flowers and then the landing is just sort of this weird like it's, it's like a the, sustained stopping of all, stopping of all the all the end yeah. right yeah, it's and it, nothing cathartic. It's cathartic in the sense of, like you said, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a breath or something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and that that could work in a movie like this, you know. Yeah. That music could do that in a movie. It's there's a lot going on in the in the in the movie. And companion to what you were doing in the music, and part of this was the emotional color flow that Ken O'Connor, who was also one of Walt Disney's veterans that worked from the Fantasia days, et cetera, he came in and did color thumbnails for the emotional flow of the whole film. So Brian McEntee, who was brilliant production designer, art director for us, he and, and also co-story, he went and talked Ken out of retirement. And so Ken took reductions of a lot of our key storyboard scenes and we would do miniature paintings to get the emotional color flow for the whole film and during that section he had invited us to go really more and more crimson with the color palette as the danger increased so we actually did put filters increasingly more adding more red into the scene at that peak moment where it jumps it's a really crimson horrible like blood scene and then in a single shot after the grinding of the toaster and the music is just like swirling through that moment it's not a hit it's like a continuing swirling thing then you see this, these jaws coming down towards the master's hand and it was just going to wow. chop his arm off and instead it slows because of the toaster grinding in the gears and slows and stops just a few inches from his hand and during that scene we took all the red away just wow. like fade 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 to natural color uh, by the end of that one shot yeah. and so musically and visually it was doing yeah, the even, same I exhale even, i didn't even that's nothing that i would have in my experience i would have looked for i so right. that's amazing to, to hear because I, I i just i i remember in a fever writing this but this is what it seemed like it should be you know it 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 it's not a it's not a uh moment it's it's like it's 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 this sort of trajectory of her climbing up falling and slowly stopping and thinking and looking up and saying what happened you know like did we did we win did we lose did, you know we, we didn't really win but we didn't lose right we're still right. alive and we're still you know it just it, it was an amazing experience for me. So I don't know what else to say. Well, and, and it was absolutely just, uh, it, it was so on target. It, 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 it will, and it was beyond on target to me. It's like it, when, when you're working at that breakneck speed and you're really focused on storytelling and emotion and character, but you're doing it at breakneck speed and you can't stop to check and to go back and rethink 
uh, even in the storyboarding, I was going through the a little bit of the schedule with the the guys who were working in the early days, and there was one day to do roughs and one day to do any corrections. That was it for the the whole process. So, as you're charging ahead, you, you're imagining this vivid thing that clearly communicates emotion to the audience, but you can't you don't have time to fiddle and make sure that it works. You just have to take your best shot once. <laughs> it's the, the, the aspiration is cinematic. It's not like, uh, you know, a line, 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 funny joke. Ha ha ha. Line, 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 joke. Ha, mm -hmm. ha, ha. Line, 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 joke. Ha ha ha. Line, 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 joke. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a movie. It's cinema. It's th th this is the thing that was so weird for Chris and me. It just, it was so cinematic. All of it. It's just, it's, it goes from here to here. Remember the scene when they, uh, there's a cue called Into the City. When they, uh, when they're, I forget how it's set up, but when they're going over a hill or something. They and, stop and, and finally they, see the city of light. Right, right. And then, the, and then they go and they go, Yahoo! And yeah, then, yeah. Is it that Lampy that does that? It's him. Yeah, I think it's right. Lampy. Wahoo! Yeah, right. yeah I say, yeah. And, and, and it was like magic. It's, it, it, you know, and then they go in and they knock on the door and all these, you know, the, the <laughs> new, you know, I don't know. It, yes, the new appliances and stuff. But it, it's so interesting. You're saying it, it's a movie. And I remember when you were and Sean, we're working, Sean Murphy, we're working together. You were just, I remember there was a discussion of like, this is, we're just making a movie and 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 he was sort of asking like how 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 should i treat this because it's animated and you're like no it's just a movie oh, like yeah. just do your best work and i remember at the mix also like several of them turning around and looking at me going okay how do because it's animated what do you want us to do and i said forget it's animated May, do the best mix for a movie you've ever done and they're like oh okay and then they turned around and started no, no, i mean they they all they all they all get it it just it, it was early on there was no pixar yet you know it it there's there yeah. was disney animation but th this was really i mean i don't i mean you probably know more than i do but i don't know what analogs there were to something like this well you know daniel <laughs> schweiger who wrote the liner notes to the to the score mm -hmm. It's in the CD. His premise, I was telling Keith that in his opening two paragraphs, his premise was dark days for Disney, Black Cauldron wasn't doing well, going through the doldrums, uh, parents were putting up with Smurfs and Little Ponies and, you know, Bluth was doing American Tale, but it was tailored specifically for kids. And then he said, eventually, Disney got back on track with Little Mermaid and was finally doing real storytelling, emotional and targeted for the whole audience. And he goes, but some of you might think that's when it happened with Little Mermaid. He said, you know, newsflash, it happened earlier with this film called The Brave Little Toaster was the change. And he said, you know, so Mermaid was the second one to <laughs> to to be in the uh, new uh, era. But unfortunately, you know, I don't get caught caught in the it got caught in politics and chess moves and uh, didn't get the theatrical release because of a chess move that was very proactive from Disney Channel to move up their release so that we, Skurus would drop our theatrical. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was really painful, but it's been, it's kind of been amazing to see it find its own audience anyway, even though we didn't get the release that we had hoped for. Yeah. And uh, I've been so touched. In fact, it's on my agenda tomorrow. It's like, at the first half of the day is answering somebody's heartfelt email who's who's not having memories of it as a child but as a current teen that's just going into high school that found it extremely emotionally helpful for her with things that she's going through in her real life and bothered to write a very eloquent long letter about that yeah. and um so I've, I've seen a lot of feedback uh for the project and a lot of people i was saying there's sort of a there's sort of a yin yang of people sort of at the same time saying it scared the crap out of me and it was such a dark movie and saying I also loved it and would watch it many, many times. Um, and oh, people I mean, who discover not, it as adults yeah, yeah, and it's not as dark as Pinocchio or, you know, it's big. well, they, I mean, I, I mean, I know I it's a love it's a, it's, it, but they describe it's, it that way. No, yeah. I know. And like I said, I got, I, when I go around, 
basically the U.S. The, these great orchestras, uh, m most of them mention Brave Little Toaster, either their kids or them, them themselves. It just it it really was early on. I mean, it 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 sort of portended uh, what's going on with animation to a degree. I mean, I, well, I, I think animation is still like. You know, joke, 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 talk, 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 <laughs> joke, 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 talk. I mean, some of them aren't, but uh, and, and some, some of them, them aren't. Are, but but yeah. there was another thing that that I think was pretty unique at the time, and that was working with improv actors with the Groundlings Improv Group. And you and I worked together on with Robin Williams on Back to Neverland. Right. After that, but, but you know but that Jerry, was this, unusual at the it, time. It, no, this was this. I mean, it's you and Rebecca or whoever it is. Mm. For me, it was you, but I don't know who was it. It's you that like were shepherding this through, and and as you said, there wasn't a lot of pushback from whatever it, it is. This, well, it was the most creative freedom I've ever had. Yeah, I mean, it's a singular. This is a singular vision, and it obviously, it's obviously a, a precursor of of a bunch of stuff that went on afterwards, and and and. I, and, and I, I, and something that I, I just would say is that uh, uh, at Tom Wilhite really allowed me to shake oh, the edge of sketch, as it were, when when I started over to take over development and story and writing and and, and directing, is because um, he knew there you know there had been some earlier development and Lasseter had been involved with that and and Joe Rampton and Brian McEntee and then that was unplugged, and he did not say I won't continue with that. He said here's the novella, start fresh. People are telling me that that would make a night short, nice short, but be more than that. It needs to be a feature. So there's a lot of development that has to happen. I think you're the guy. So you have my, uh, I, I, I don't have much time and much money, but you have creative freedom. So he really offered that and, and allowed it. So. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. That's it. Right. So, uh, well, I, and I just, I, it, it just means so much to me, David. I, your, your contribution uh, is Jerry, huge. I, Star Wars has like its score. You remember the score when you walk away as much as anything else. And I think with Brave Little Toaster, you did that huge I, fingerprint. I, I, I was, it was just an absolute pleasure. It, it was one of the peak experiences of my life. So thank you. Well, thank you. All right. Right. I feel like I have a. I do feel like I'm a person next to me. <laughs> well, Susie, you, you, uh, when you came on to this, I'm trying to remember what state it was in because David had been working on the song arrangements and stuff, and and you know he told us that you were going to be the person to come in and wrangle all the singers to to like create all these voices because. That, like I didn't know from where we were going to get people to sing for all these different cars and appliances and like cutting edge and worthless and stuff and and so I, how did you how did you first receive the material to start casting to I'm trying to remember well I um you know I I, I was trying to find that cassette remember I told you I have a cassette yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I think it's in my garage with all my important stuff because I didn't want to lose it. I have like a little yeah. thing. But anyway, um, I had a cassette of the songs and I, I can't remember how I even got this job. I think it was through Galen Horton. Uh, do you, does that, that sound familiar? Galen? N not immediately. Who's, uh, what? Well, he was, was, uh, he was uh, at the time, you know, I had just had this whole country music career before yeah yes i think i came and saw you do a set on uh, at the palomino. uh, uh yes at the palomino <laughs> and there was a song back from the dead or something about this guy who keeps keeps uh, getting knocked off and finds himself re reconstituted and Probably. just back at it again yeah maybe yeah there's, that sounds very country yes um, but anyway galen was uh producing me at that point and then um um I think I was I was just kind of trying to decide it was a time like do I want to continue my career and taking some changes and changing producers and labels and um and I moved out to LA and started doing a lot of studio work and 
it was just, it, that's a whole nother story. It was just a different time in life, got to war, I was married, got divorced, blah, blah, blah. So um, anyway, Galen would send me out for um, like different, you know, movie dates, sound, uh, sound alikes. He was doing a lot of contracting and this, he must have, he must have heard about this because I, I didn't know you. I didn't know David. So it must have been a, through a third party. And uh, yeah. I, I do, I don't, my memory, I've been trying to, like, how do I remember? I, I remember only that um, I had really never done anything like this before. But that's, I, that's such a story for all of us. It's like first first time jump, jumping in. Yeah, I'd worked with groups of singers, of course, you know, and stuff like that. Um, um, big and small groups. And so, uh, but I just, I loved it. I, I heard this, there were, must have been some songs done because on that cassette, um, there's songs with Deanna singing. And I don't think I heard Deanna in the studio. I think her stuff must have been done first. Well, I remember at the, at the beginning where Van Dyke was working on the, the core of the songs and then they would go to David and David was working with how they would be arranged and, mm -hmm. All, all the different aspects to bring them alive to to go in and out of his score um and so i'm trying to remember whether we had deanna temp sing some of it but i do we recall did. that when we did something like um like b movie mm -hmm. where there are all the other characters oh, yeah. singing but then there was but then there was our core team including deanna and myself singing for radio and tim stack and and thurl yeah, would come in and sing the the you know the quintet stuff together for our our own little team uh, to to coexist with what you you know the people that you had brought in. So I think quite a few of us were gathered in that studio for some of the sessions. Yeah, um, you know the singers. I I just remember thinking I have to get the best singers I know. <laughs> I do remember that, and so. Um, I before I brought the team of singers, there were eight of us. Mm -hmm. uh, before I brought the singers in, um, I know I worked with you mm -hmm. a little bit, and I know I remember because what was the name of that studio, Jerry? Uh, David Newman remembered it. I did not write it down when he mentioned it, but I think he yeah. said it was in Topanga Canyon. It was a ranch. It was like a little ranchy kind of area. You had to take a dirt road to get there, and there was a lot of wood. Yes, I remember a lot of wood and and like um, uh, 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 like covered wagon wheels and stuff like that. And I have been Cherokee or something like rustic. that. That sounds familiar. Yeah, and uh, but I do remember, and it was small. I mean, the rooms were pretty small that we were. A lot of us were in. Yes. Um, but um, I brought these great singers in, and what I remember was. Um, when, I mean, we, I mean, it was, everybody just did such a great job. And um, I think I'd given them, I can't remember, did I give them the songs before we got there? I don't know if we just read it and sang it. I can't remember, but, but there were like, um, like uh, the different song, the different songs where there were multiple characters. You just had a bunch of us do a bunch of things. Right. And then I think you guys just chose what you wanted. But I remember, I mean, I, I don't remember. But there, but for featured things like in Worthless, where each race car and the bus and different ones each had a, a very good single voice that sang for that character before its demise, where, when it was crushed. Yeah. Um, that those were, you, you got such standout voices. And I'm sure that your career as a singer, a solo singer yourself, before you started getting into wrangling other people as well, mm -hmm. Well, you know, gave you a good frame of mind to choose, you know, because you sang some of the roles yourself. Yeah. I think you sang the microwave and, and one of the sports cars, too. Um, but so you were realizing that this isn't just background stuff. These are featured moments with characters and you found great people. For well, that. And I chose those people for those reasons, because, you know, I, I knew they could do it. I mean, I knew they could do it. They were all made. But um, it was so much fun. And I, like I said the other day, you know, just you guys would direct a little bit. I, I guess it was you that was telling me, sing it Southern and sing it a little more sexy, <laughs> the sexy microwave. Um, <laughs> right, yes. And that was fun. But I mean, just getting a chance to try different things and everybody just fit. I'm, 
It's the most amazing production. I think it just fit. I mean, I remember it like it just fit together. Everybody worked together. Everybody was super friendly. And when we were doing the Zoom the other day, yes, the creators were all talking. I thought that's exactly how the music was. Right. Well, and I remember uh, Timothy E. Day, the little little boy that was singing for Blanky. And I remember it was so cute to watch the two of you together. You know, you'd be saying, I, I remember witnessing some things where you were like, oh, let me see, where were you? Where were we in this song? And he would go, oh, we're at bar 42. And you're like, oh, yes. And he'd get, it's like he was so locked into how you were working and following along. And he was able to understand where we were in the piece. Yeah. And he was such a sophisticated little dude. And it was just so cute to see the two of you working together for his his singing part. Well, you know, I mean, that's what I do. I've worked with kids. Now I've worked with kids for the last 25 years. I mean, I just work with kids, singers and, you know, groups of singers and and um, I teach kids and I work with children. I mean, that's my whole thing. So for me to work with Timothy was it's a real you know, super blessing for me. It was just so much fun. It was just, you know, and he was so good. And he, was, he must have done a lot of things before that. <laughs> you know what? He had a very, uh, uh, I, I looked him up and he had a, a, a almost invisible career. I can't find, I, I could not find him. I wanted to have him be part of this. Yeah. And looking on LinkedIn and Facebook and Google and Wikipedia and everything, People really know him for Blanky, but there's only one picture I found of him that looked real as uh, th there were all kinds of things where it's like pictures of Timothy E. Day and some of them were women and, and other recognizable actors and stuff. And you're like, no, that's not. And then there was one where I went, yes, that's him as an adult, but I could not find him uh, anywhere. Oh, and his mom, his mom, it was the sweetest thing. She was very patient and she was the opposite of a stage parent. She would just bring him to the session and sit back when we were recording the voice work before the singing, I sort of got to know her a little bit. But she said that he had just seen kids on TV like doing voice work and somehow he had put two and two together when he saw an animated character with a kid's voice that that was a kid doing the voice. Now, sometimes it's an adult, but sometimes it's a kid doing the kid voice. And he and she said he had said, Mom, I, I could do that. And so she and he wanted to go audition for something and she just drove him because he asked and he right. started to get noticed. And so she just brought him to our session because he had asked to do it. She drove him there. Right. I loved him. I cast him. And then she was just like, hey, this is son's idea. I'm just, I can't believe it's happening. I'm just here to drive him. <laughs> I mean, it's Uber before there was an Uber. Um, and so he didn't come from this whole background of like different shows and the sort of having, getting known as a kid star and having a parent that was plugged into the whole, I have an agent for my kid or whatever. He was just this mysterious little boy that said, I could do that. And then he did. And he would always ask me his motivation. He would, you know, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What's the character going through? And then he would really, armed with that, nail it. And so we started calling him One Take Timmy because he was so good at that. So by the time he came to do the singing with you, you know, he really had gotten in the groove as that character. No, I do remember that. He probably ruined me for the rest of my <laughs> life working with kids <laughs> or, or set a standard that I, you know, expect everybody to hit. To be that, to be that <laughs> good. So, now, now, what was now the extreme difference of working with somebody brand new, but now a veteran who's so well known, like Bill Ravenscroft, and you're working with him? Well, I mean, you know, what is there to say? He's he's he was just amazing. What a sweet man! And I, I remember he would tell us stories, and um, he, I mean, you know, you don't. He was such a pro. It was like one take Timmy like <laughs> half a take thorough you know? yes so I mean just being around him I mean somebody you've heard all your life and all of that was pretty amazing for me like I said this is the first big movie thing I've done so um it was and it, I mean everybody was like that I I have seen the only person I've seen since then is Deanna I've seen her at a couple of times at different um big improv things where she's on stage, but um, I haven't seen anybody else. 
Jones. Right. And Noah Thurl passed away. Yes, and I, I, it's, I saw him one time after that, I mentioned, where I was going into Imagineering on Flower Street in Glendale, where the, the Imagineering headquarters was, and he was uh, stepping out of there and just saw me in the parking lot in the evening and stopped and in his rich voice was asking, you know, you know, whatever happened with Toaster? And that was such a wonderful film. And uh, boy, I just, I, I found out so much about him when he would tell us the stories. Yeah. And I sent, and I sent, shared some of the pictures with you that I am, am sharing with the whole uh, Spark group for, uh, you know, for them to, to intersperse here. But there were a number of pictures where we're sitting with Thurl and he's gesturing and going on with different stories and and you and I and David and Chuck Richardson who was there we're all going through all these different kind of expressions listening to his stories uh just the the sweetest thing stories about Elvis and Walt Disney and oh you have a good memory are you are you remembering all those stories I I remember one in particular that he told us about being on the the Mississippi in a paddle wheel boat uh for for a, like a, you know it was just he and his wife were doing that to relax uh -huh. and he told us about that and he said that he that the captain knew he was on board and knew who he was mm -hmm. but he had kept it a secret as thorough you know he just wanted to relax and so i think he was talking quietly because yeah. anybody would hear his voice would know like hey and so, but then he said that the, the captain asked him, is it okay, because I have a band here on board that's playing to music entertainment for people, would you grace us with a, a song now that we're near the end and today's the last day? So Thurl said, oh, okay, you can go for it. So he said the captain introduced him to the crowd, voice of Tony the Tiger, I think was the most famous thing he was known for, although to me, all the different Disney things were, were what I knew him from and the Johnny Man singers and on and on. So, uh, but anyway, the captain introduced him, the audience loved that. And he said he sang Old Man River on the Mississippi on a paddle boat. Oh and he said, he said, I, I could have died and gone to heaven that day and be happy. It was just like the yeah. most wonderful oh, thing. I and I imagine what it was it. like to be, can you imagine being one of those few people that was on the paddle boat on the Mississippi listening to Thurl sing? Oh no God. smartphones to record it. I yes, mean, nothing God. back then. Uh, maybe big clunky video recorders. I don't know. But yeah, what a memory that would be. Yeah, I, I don't have real clear memories of um, the stories, the exact things. It's more like it actually happened pretty fast, too. Yes. I think we were only there for two days. I mean, did mm -hmm. I think so, right? It would seem like we, pow, we just have to get this done. And we, you know, we squished yep. in more at the end. I do remember that. And I was like, come on, you guys, we got to do this. And yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, it was almost like a live session where you're stepping up to the mics. It's almost like open mic night where you would like shove somebody up and they'd go sing apart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do remember. And maybe that's why my memory I was like, how come I don't remember more? I think it would just happen so fast. You know, yeah. Well, I do recall you, uh, certainly from my standpoint, seeing you coordinate with everyone and bring in all those singers who were so capable and so well cast for the different things. And, you know, when we've tried different things, you were so great at working with them to see what they, you know, what their specialty thing could be that might shine in a moment. And then you go, oh, that's perfect to have that person take it. Yeah. And but then you also helped just help. All, I felt more comfortable as a director seeing you coordinate well with everyone and just keep all the cats wrangled as it were. And then also just getting confidence to, to make it through singing in that character voice. Cause I, I was not ready to sing as radio. That was a last minute thing. I had to remind David Newman that he, that he coaxed me into that uh, because Lovitz was busy. He was on Saturday night live. So I had been doing temp voices just for the ensemble to hear as we were recording them. And when I was to figure out what the heck do we do now that there's singing and I need Lovitz to sing. And he said, well, just, you've been practicing doing his voice, just sing it. So, uh, but I was so insecure about that and you really helped. Although in listening back, I heard something in City of Light where I, uh, my voice cracked 
uh, and a high note oh, as, yeah. as the radio. Yeah. But 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 Rebecca was going, but it sounds cute. So oh, oh no no no, that. I mean that's perfect. I'm surprised. <laughs> I was, I know I know that crap. I love that. Crap. <laughs> but you know what? I think I think that um, he did a fantastic job of matching his speaking voice. I mean, you know, just the singing speaking voice, all great. Um, and as far as just wrangling singers, as you were talking, I'm thinking, you know, that's kind of, I think that's probably, like I said, I work with children mm -hmm. and I love pulling things out of children and people are always like, you see things in them, you see things, we, you know, that no one else sees you just, and I think that must be part of my, you know, people have gift, that's something that is easy for me to do. So you know, this doing that and, and going, you can do this. I, you can do that. That's in you or that's in you. I think that's probably, that's something I really, really enjoy. So if I did a good job, it's because I enjoy it so much. And well, I challenge. <laughs> well, I felt like I heard that going on in B movie when the characters are singing, there goes the sun, here comes the night, somebody turn on the light. And Blanky was singing that. And he seemed so wistful and hoping that there was thing to cling to and i felt like you had really helped yeah helped, uh you know i think we can, get that. I, yeah i think we did we talked a lot about feelings i do remember that we talked a, a lot about you know like i think you even brushed on it before i mean you probably worked with them that way this mm -hmm. you were in this place what did, how would you feel and but he was like i said everybody was so quick to pick up what they needed to do and i mean that's just the magic around that this little film is is everybody did that and um you know it just it worked i was listening or when i was getting ready i was listening to um i started to listen to the soundtrack right and again, the overture i thought man this is so ahead of somebody said it on the zoom call it's so yeah. ahead of its time um david did a fantastic job yeah it really was a, a bold like everything from epic to absolutely intimate mm -hmm. and completely tragic to sweet um in like a big statement uh it was it was it's it so was about the depth of meaning that the story intended rather than strictly stopping with the the amount of time and money we had to get a certain rich look because we had very little money and time. So, yeah. you know, I was used I to, <laughs> you know, and our standards for what we would have reached for if we had more time and money, you know, we had desires to go far beyond what we were able to do in our limited rush. But he musically just went all the way to our full intentions for what the story meant, mm -hmm. rather than stopping with how much we were able to make it look like what the story meant. He he understood the emotional underpinnings and just went fully there. Right. You know, this, the time, the money and time thing, I do remember something, um, there was, um, you were right at the end of it, and I can't remember what song it was, but there was a song and um, David, I remember talking to David, he just wanted one more thing, you know, and Daryl Fennessy could do it. And and David's like, could you just throw it in, you know, just like throw it in, because we're kind of out of my money or something i can't remember what it was but i was like sure he will <laughs> <laughs> right because no, since yet. you were also the vocal contractor you were dealing with uh right. how many yeah, hours and right i remember i hadn't done this big thing before so i was like sure he'll do it <laughs> god thank you god that daryl is such a great guy because <laughs> i went to him and i said you know you're gonna you're gonna can you just throw this in he's like okay <laughs> <laughs> but it oh. was, i mean it just was great he was not you know we did we didn't care I'm so glad that he and other people were in the mood of just like, we're here in the moment. Let's try to make as much magic as possible. And so I'm so glad that they took it that way. I, I, and it, it, it delights me to hear that because, you know, there, there's, there's a train of thought of, of just having a job. And of course, we all need jobs and we make a living. But when you can be making a living at something you love and for us, you know, we were so starving creatively to do something meaningful and creative and that we could be proud of that to us, this was the first chance we had to just fully take responsibility for something creative. And, it, and it's like it was it was sort of our group was doing a thing and it was the first time. 
to have that much freedom. Yeah. And so for us, it was the opposite of, well, it's a job to get paid and you go home and you, like your, your real life is the things other than that, but you have your job. You know, the, the couple of the producers had said, oh, just send the storyboards overseas and something will come back. And, you know, so there were a bunch of us that were going, well, no, we want to make a good movie. We're not just like, we got paid for a few hours and now we're going on to the next thing. We want to take this all the way to the finish line and get, put as much magic in it as possible because we want to be proud of this and we want to be proud of each other and we want the audience to enjoy what we did and not have to just say, well, it's not very good, but it was just a job. I got paid, you know, was, so I'm so glad that, uh, but you can't ever expect everybody to be in that mindset. And yeah, but you know what, it was just kind of wonderful. Yeah, but I, I know for, I can speak for the singers, they all were, and we've, I know talking afterwards and since, since then, everybody so enjoyed it. And I've never wor worked on anything like that again. And um, I, I think I, it kind of, you know, it, it always filters down from the top. Right? And you are, you know, it, I, a lot of it's because of you and who you are and just your attitude about everything, how much, how, um, how creative you are and how give, I'm just going to just gush on you. <laughs> I'm seriously, I mean, a lot of it, uh, a, a big, big part of it is from you. Well, I so You're appreciate right? that. And I, 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 I was so appreciating the creativity coming from each one of you individually. And so to me, it was, uh, you know, a lot of the positivity and joy that I was showing to you was because I felt it so much from what you were all contributing every day. Yeah, well, I worked on a lot of things where we didn't have that. So, I mean, I know the difference. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and, I, and I've seen that too. And I've, I'm so frustrated when I see that because creative work that is a business can be really fun. Mm -hmm. And it can be a joyous thing where you create families that want to be together again in in future projects, you know, and and uh, forgive me a bleepable moment, but you know, everybody knows what a shit list is. Yeah. But um, we also, there is, is the must work with again list. And, you know, that there was a lot of people wound up on that positive list from this project. I remember going to the premiere, wait a premiere. At Wadsworth Theater was probably yeah. where where it was shown, and and uh, that, yeah, I remember oh, us being there, and a lot of news 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 crews showed up. Yeah. Uh, it was before we went to Sundance with the film. Yeah, and I to... I just remember just being like, wow. <laughs> I'm 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 being totally honest. I was like, wow, that was incredible. Uh, you know, after seeing everything put together and all of that, right. So, you had a little part in you, you know, you don't get to see it until the end. But I'm sure right. the premier at all. But um, but that was just really just kind of wow, that was really good. <laughs> you know, proud to be was, part of it. Yeah, I was so proud to have you on board too, and all and all everything you brought to it and and, and the confidence that you gave me to the whole process because you were you know being part of it and so solidly approaching it and to me it was a wonderful thing to go see you on stage performing at the palomino uh, yeah. and going you know to see you like entertaining a crowd live and going you know it, to me that uh, it made me relate you to what the groundlings do it's like i was hiring people who were used to getting a real crowd there and giving them a, a real engaging time and so <laughs> To, you know, there, sometimes there can be a removal where people are only in a studio and are not used to that connection moment with an audience. And I, and I, you know, to me, like when you finish the movie, it's all about did we connect with the audience? And it made me feel good to see you connecting with a real audience and seeing Deanna Oliver and John Lovitz and Tim Stack and Phil Hartman and uh, Mindy Sterling and Judy Tull, like connecting with a real live audience just before they came in to, to work with us. And it gave me more confidence that we would connect with our audience at that premiere right. and beyond. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's uh, people who love people, you know. Right. That's it. There is. I hadn't thought about that, but then I'm thinking about everybody that was uh, part of that singing the vocal group was definitely somebody in that everybody was in that category. But um, yeah, there's a real there's a very big difference in that. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, hopefully some of that energy, you know, makes it through the screen to the audience. And I, I uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say that, it, you know, that you uh, sort of made a mini wrecking crew 
of uh, music for our for our song. If you you know <laughs> the, the musical reference for Wrecking Crew. <laughs> Hey, so, um, yeah, I would love to see a big Reese. Did, did you see the documentary on that, by by the way, The Wrecking Crew? Which one? You mean uh, the, the real that, Wrecking Crew? Yes, that, that did well, that did the, uh, the behind so many hit songs. Yeah, in the past. because I will actually, I'm actually in the book, Don, Don Randy. Do you know Don Randy? He's part of The Wrecking Crew. Ah, well, I, I don't I remember specifically, but I remember the, the 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 woman who was the bassist, and there were so many people in the in oh, the yeah. Wrecking Crew that were just amazing. There's a book called The Wrecking Crew that I'm I've had, I think I have like a half a couple pages or something because he used to be my um, piano player when I was recording. Yes. But yeah, I, I do know those guys. I mean, yeah. Before well, our, I wanted them to know that I didn't actually mean somebody was doing demolition, but somebody that was doing extraordinary music magic. <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> else I wanted to say to you oh I know what it was I think this is kind of funny when you guys were talking the other day on the big zoom call and and they were saying you know the kids like reacted they they loved it or it kind of scared them and sometimes both like it scared the crap out of me and I loved it I've heard that too oh, well because my son loved it and my daughter was scared the crap out of her <laughs> I had one on each side so even now she's like oh mom I can't I think I can watch that movie she's 28. right <laughs> you know what's funny somebody asked me about the you know a lot of people have zeroed in on the the clown fireman in the nightmare and um you know I told them well I I was inspired by Dumbo and seeing that the clowns that were firemen that would light a fire and the poor little Dumbo is up on the scaffold and not that to me was the spookiest thing for that little character and so to me for toaster to have like a recollection of that I I didn't feel like I was breaking shocking ground <laughs> when when I put that in the nightmare I felt like I was doing a little tip of the hat to Disney's Dumbo animated feature you know? yeah and I would have thought the same way I totally get that yeah and and it to me, I never thought of, I mean, I always thought it was just a great story. It's just a wonderful story and never done before. Right yeah, in, inanimate objects as the star was, is pretty unusual. So, mm -hmm. but I, but I was so glad that you came in and just gave each character um, a, that sort of inner soul that made it feel like a, a living thing. I think that's why, you know, some people talk about worthless as a, a, a a really dark song kind of unusually hard hitting because it's you see each character just before its demise it's like you can't reconstitute the little cube the little crushed cube is gone um and so they talk about each character sings before its death and it's it's so nice that you know my wife rebecca and i were just hearing some voices recently that were just so annoying it's like it was stuff made made for kids but i think actually kids would like it better if it wasn't this way but it was right. such annoying voice work that it just made you want to scream and run and turn the thing off but you know it, with uh, with all our voice work including the the voice acting and the voice singing uh, i felt a, just a real commitment to not try to do like this is a kitty thing or this is a pretend thing but just to commit to here's the moment here's the story moment here's the character moment here's what it's been through and uh, you know in its life and here's what it's facing and let's just make that come alive real right now uh, and you just did that you know we I was, I was trying to remember we didn't have picture i don't think when we were singing did we do you remember that i think we probably had storyboards to refer yeah. to a partial animatics but nothing nothing that was finished because we had later had to animate to your tracks oh. so i think the best we had was storyboards Okay, because, uh, yeah, I remember that. I think I was trying to think, how did we under... Because later we animated uh, a little yeah. follow, carefully following your, your tracks to animate. And the too. songs, I mean, the songs, I mean, it, it, you know, you know what's going on by the lyric in the song. I mean, you know, these guys are crushed and, you know, and like, I just can't, I just can't. Uh, you know, <laughs> I just so, can't, I just can't get started. <laughs> yes. Uh, trying to spit those words up. And, um, but I mean, it, so I guess we didn't need that. A lot of times, you know, you see the picture, but I mean, with the, with the characters, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just had a few sketches. So you guys really had to fill in a lot of blanks with their, a lot of gaps. Sketches. 
Well, it was a it was a joy to see that part happen because I would I would go from sort of piano at Van Dyke Park's house with uh, sitting in sort of a a uh, bay window with a little piano and let me hear some of, of what he was uh, concocting in terms of the the songs okay. and then and then it would go to uh, David where it would then he would go into really now here's how it's going to be arranged and how it's going to fit with the score and everything so then I would see it grow there and then to see it really come alive with the the singers instead of temp stuff yeah. that that just that was the blooming of it it's where I knew that we could animate to that and it would be great so um, I'm going to ask you a question what happened to Van Dyke Pops? I don't know uh, his full path since then. I think he did some some wonderful work, uh, you know, following up with the the Beach Boys with Brian Wilson. Just I think doing some solo collaboration with uh, with Brian Wilson, and uh, so I saw uh, what was it ca called? Um, Keith, do you recall or Mindy? There was a uh, there was an album that Van Dyke put out a few years ago that was called something like orange carton orange carton labels or is it was some kind of cute, yeah, cute title, title to it hmm. and um so i you know i had seen him do some of those things and i and i had looked i i did some research recently and looked back on his earlier work and i was shocked at how absolutely avant-garde he'd gotten in the days when it was i think he he was actually affecting choices that the Beatles were making, as well as the Beach Boys yeah. in uh, some things that predated Sgt. Peppers and stuff wow. that was just, and he didn't do all of it in that style, but I listened to one where I just went, oh my God, um, it's, you know, he definitely influenced some major people back in the day. So, so, I, so to me, I have bragging rights to say, well, I sang on a Van Dyke Park song. <laughs> 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 Brian Wilson, you're not the only one. Um, so uh, it was the orange. What was that? Mindy found the the name of it. It was the orange crate. Orange crate art. Orange crate art. That was the name of the album. Yeah, I remember some, hearing some really sweet tracks from that. Is he still around, or? I think so. I'm not quite sure, but it was uh, it was just wonderful. I I would take. Uh, walks through his basil garden. He was growing growing basil out in the yard. So we'd be sitting at the piano playing and it was cute. He'd talk about things he remembered as a, you know, growing up and some old folk tunes that he might grab a little piece of that to stick into a piece of music. And uh, and then we go walk through. Italian through while you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then, and then we'd go walk in his basil garden and. <laughs> Some fresh basil and stuff so it was a very aromatic as well as musical experience i love it so i i mean i i don't think i ever i never met him i would have remembered that probably right sweet character yeah well okay well uh if there's any other memories you have i, I hope you enjoy the the photographs i sent you the link to the oh did you pictures behind the scenes so if you go there i send it to your email so if you go there, if you need me to send it to your message, I could, Borda can send that, but you can go look at all the pictures that I uh, shared with you all that, that day we did the Zoom. And so you can either hit download all, or you can just get some of the, the pictures you like the most and download single, single things. So I've been trying to get in touch with singers, um, a couple of them, I can't find them, but to find out, um, you know, if anybody else had anything. That they Ro Roger, uh, uh, Roger Freeland got, you know, he was with us on the other Zoom and he got back in touch yeah. and um, he he wrote a wonderful email telling some of his backstory and okay. he actually, uh, you know, I worked on the first Tron and he actually came and visited the set of the first Tron while we <laughs> were making it. So we compared notes and there were so many times where it looked like we likely crossed paths and, and uh, he you know, he worked with uh, Rob Minkoff was his neighbor in Los Feliz. And of course, Rob Minkoff was, you know, did character design. And, we, and I based the master's look off of, that's why I called him Rob too, was Rob. Rob Minkoff was oh, really? with us doing doing character design. And and then I 
designed the character of the master to look like Rob. So the glasses and the kind of what he would typically wear mm -hmm. was what Rob Minkoff would wear. So, and I named the master Rob after Rob Minkoff. And he was our neighbor too, where in the house where I am right now, I used to be able to walk out our front door and look like five houses down and see in the front window of Rob's house, see him sitting at his piano in a puffy white bathrobe practicing the piano. <laughs> and so we would take our, our firstborn when he was about three years old down to, cause he was so interested in the piano. So we'd take him down there and knock on the door and ask Rob if, if Ian could sit in at the piano. So he would, he's like three years old. Sure. And so, and he's now a composer. Our old, old our older son is a, a composer by trade, but he, yes, he is. He's a film composer, but he got to sit at Rob Minkoff's piano and practice when he was three. <laughs> so Roger had Rob as a neighbor in Los Feliz area, and I had had Rob as a neighbor here for a while, and so we just had so many small world connections. Yeah, I um, yeah, Janice and I talked today, and I said, "Is there anything else that you can remember?" And she said, "I just remember we switched one of the singers like right towards the end because one of the one of our sopranos had to leave, had another session." She had oh. Mm -hmm. probably don't remember that so she had a sub I neither one of us could remember who she sent in but somebody came in and did the rest of Beth's uh the session for Beth I I said I didn't even remember that it might cause me anxiety so I probably put it right away. right <laughs> but she did a great job I mean nothing you know she did, can't tell but I'd forgotten about that and um I don't know I haven't been able to reach the other you know people move and you can't find them and right well I, I you know i sent the link i think to joe pizzullo right. and to beth and to to uh, uh and roger joined us but i think gary uh, gary falcon uh, falcone i had sent the note too as well oh, good but a big it, so i you know I, I sent the link for people to get pictures um and I, I sent it to the bigger group than was at our last zoom so you don't have any pictures of the singing do you i don't i have a lot of, with you and me and yeah. thorough yeah when we were working together yeah i wish we had a picture of the singing group but it, you know and, and that might be somewhere that somebody might have photographs of it it's just I, I don't personally have them in my in my collection yeah so easy these days with our phones well, and I, I, I wish I could find pictures of uh, Phil Hartman because we, you know, we had a wonderful session together, yeah. where he came in solo to do his work. And uh, but I, and, and I know somebody was taking pictures. I just haven't been able to find them. Well, you're doing a really good job looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have found I found quite Everybody. a few. So, <laughs> and some of those uh, that I posted, I'll, I'll make sure I resend a link to you just to make sure you have it. Okay. All right, Susie. Well, thank you so much, and uh, just uh, thanks for being part of the magic. It's it's truly has stood the test of time, and in that short amount of time of just hyper focusing, you pulled it off. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> well, we we all you know pulled it off together. But thank you very much. I appreciate that.